John Maynard Keynes' critiques of economists' focus on long-run economic performance opened the door to an entire new school of thought for analyzing the macroeconomy. We can capture most of the principles of this school of thought using what has grown to be known as a cornerstone of macroeconomic analysis, the aggregate supply, aggregate demand, or ASAD model. Through this model, we can examine the relationship between an economy's price level and real gross domestic product, or output from the economy. This relationship works through the mechanisms of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We graphically represent the relationship between the price level and aggregate demand using the AD curve, which is downward sloping or negatively related to the economy's price level because of rational reactions from the sources of aggregate demand to price changes. On the other hand, the slope of the aggregate supply, or AS curve, depends upon time. In the short run, sooner than input prices can change, the AS curve is upward sloping or positively related to the price level. That's because as final output prices increase, producers can take advantage of the difference between them and locked input costs to reap larger profit margins. With their costs locked, producers will turn to either hiring or firing employees to adjust output for price level changes. In the long run, though, far ahead enough where all prices are negotiable, we should expect the economy to perform along its trend or potential output, which implies the economy will seek out equilibrium in its labor markets and, by consequence, find an equilibrium level of output, regardless of the price level in the economy. That's why our long-run aggregate supply, or LRAS curve, is a vertical line originating from the x-axis. This also means that we can graphically show how shifts in either of these curves can change where they intersect or meet equilibrium, and therefore change the level of employment and, as a consequence, output in the economy. What would actually cause these curves to shift? Well, for example, the Affordable Care Act may have shifted more health care costs onto firms, which would increase their real labor costs and cause a leftward shift, a contraction in short-run aggregate supply at every given price level. An increase in government purchases, or in personal consumption, financed by transfer payments, could cause the AD curve to shift to the right, an expansion of the aggregate demand curve at every given price level. These shifts happen around our LRS curve, and for the most part explain why our economy under or overperforms. Underperformance results in a recessionary gap, which is identified as real GDP in the short run below potential or real GDP in the long run. Graphically, the recessionary gap can be identified by the AS and AD curves intersecting to the left of the LRAS curve. Overperformance results in an inflationary gap, which is identified as real GDP in the short run above potential output. Graphically, the inflationary gap is illustrated by the AS and AD curves intersecting to the right of the LRAS curve. Note that inflation isn't necessary for an inflationary gap, nor do all recessionary gaps only exist during recessions. Also, keep in mind their parallels. Recessionary gaps will only exist when levels of employment are below natural equilibrium, and the opposite is true of inflationary gaps. All right, so we now know how we have gaps and how to identify them, whether using the potential output or the natural level of employment as a yardstick. But how does the economy get back on track? That can theoretically happen with or without our help. The with our help option would be intervention policies, specifically contractionary policies to close inflationary gaps and expansionary policies to close recessionary gaps. Contractionary policies are designed to cool down the economy and might include reducing government spending and transfer payments in the case of contractionary fiscal policy or raising interest rates as a contractionary monetary policy. Expansionary policies are designed to stimulate the economy and may include increasing government transfer payments or purchases or cutting interest rates as fiscal and monetary policies respectively. We examine fiscal policy and monetary policy individually, but you can appreciate for now that there are two avenues that the government can use to intervene against output gaps and influence the macroeconomy. On the other hand, the without our help option would include sitting back and waiting for prices to adjust in such a way as to encourage higher output. For example, after entering a recessionary gap, theoretically nominal wages should start to drop as lower employment levels lead to less output and lower incomes for demanding goods and services. 
At some point, nominal wages will probably fall low enough to sustain steady recovery in employment levels, trending back toward potential output. Similar could happen during an inflationary gap, where nominal wages could rise as efforts to reach higher levels of output result in stronger demand for labor, reaching a point at which labor becomes so expensive that output begins contracting. So which is it? Should we or shouldn't we help? Well, Keynes was clearly on the side of help in the circumstances of severe recessionary gaps. His writings after the Great Depression make clear his sentiment that government intervention may be critical to backstop aggregate demand. In the face of non-intervention, austerity, and even contractionary monetary policy from the Fed, the Great Depression only seemed to worsen and deepen. Keynes was making the case that hanging tight, or worse, managing our macroeconomy like a household budget requiring fiscal prudence, was pointless, because even if the economy would at some point in the future return to its long-run trend, no one could specify just how many weeks, months, or years that could take, in which case, in the long run, aren't we all dead?